So Christmas 2000 was a Christmas I will never forget. It was the year that the PlayStation 2 came out. And it was the hot new toy on the market, right? Had the best games, had the best graphics, and you better believe I was doing everything I could to get one of these bad boys, right? I covered all my bases. I talked to mom, I talked to dad, I talked to grandma, I even talked to Santa Claus, all right? I went to school and I told my friends, just in case you're feeling generous, here's what I want for Christmas, right? And this was no small ask. These things were several hundred dollars at the time, but I was in pursuit of this PlayStation 2. And my mom had this, she really made the anticipation of Christmas Day just like really big in our home. She got the tree up early in December and she would put presents under it in an increasing fashion. So every day we'd go, we'd get home from school, we'd toss our school stuff to the side and go straight to the base of the tree, checking out every present. Oh, I've got five and you got three. I'm the favored child, you know, kind of arguing. But we were always, the biggest present for some reason was the best one. But I was looking for a very specific kind of box. Though it was wrapped, I knew the dimensions of a PlayStation 2. Because every time we went to Walmart, I took mental calculations, all right? I was all about getting this. And we had one rule in our home on Christmas, you are not allowed to pick up the present. The threat was you pick it up, it goes back to the store, right? So I got within inches of these things, but there's no way I'm going to pick it up. And so I... uh, Uh, One day I get home from school and sure enough, under the Christmas tree, there's a box with my name on it. And it looks just about PlayStation sized. And I'm trying so hard to keep it cool because I don't want people to know that I know. But I'm like, yes! And I go to school the next day and I tell my friends, I'm getting a PlayStation 2. If you don't get one, you can come to my house and watch me play. You can bask in my glory. You're definitely not going to have a turn though. Right? I was so excited. And uh, uh, Christmas Eve came, and we had a tradition where you get to open a present on Christmas Eve. And so my dad hands me a box that is not the box that I believe my PlayStation is in. And so I I said, Dad, no, I want to open that one. And my mom said, no, we're saving that for tomorrow. And this only confirmed my suspicions. Of course they save the best for last, right? So we go to bed that night, and I wake up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, right? I'm like, I'm jazzed about opening these presents. So I run into my parents' room. It's technically Christmas, right? 3 a.m., but it's technically Christmas. And I say, Mom, Dad, it's Christmas. Can we open our presents? And my my mom and dad sit up, they look at the clock, and they said, if you don't go back to bed, there will be no Christmas. (laughs) So I went back to bed. We woke up later in the morning, and we had this grueling tradition where you had to sit there and watch each person open their gift, right? So I'm just waiting as my sister opens a Barbie doll or a doll or whatever it was. And then finally, it's my turn. And my dad hands me the box. And when he handed it to me, my my heart kind of sank a little bit. This feels a little bit too light to be a PlayStation. But I'm so convinced at this point, I'm like, no, it's just the the technology. They've gotten so slim with these things. It's got to be, this is a PlayStation. And I ripped the box open. And my heart sank as my eyes feasted on a box full of Wool socks. Wool socks. Okay, I'm sorry. Wool socks are not a gift. They are an insult, okay? (laughs) To a teenage boy who wants a PlayStation 2, I got wool socks and I was devastated. My whole Christmas was ruined, right? I thought this was going to be the epitome of my teenage life. And I was devastated. Why? Because Christmas was about me. About what I wanted about having the traditions that I needed, about having time away from school, about getting the things that I want. Christmas was about Jason. It was not about Jesus. And celebrating Christmas without Christ is at the essence, it's idolatry. And so today, I want us to remember what happened that first Christmas day. I want us to walk in the shoes of the people who experienced it. And I want us to ultimately savor the gift of our Savior. That God gave us the greatest gift, greater than anything that's under the tree on the first Christmas. So we're going to be kind of all over the Christmas story in Matthew and Luke. So if you open your Bibles, stick with me here. Um, But we're going to start in Matthew 1. Oh, here's a picture of the PlayStation that I wanted, by the way. I didn't get it. But uh, 
yeah, I can bask in its glory through here. Matthew 1, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, he was found to be, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had it in mind to divorce her quietly. So here's the story. Joseph and Mary love each other, right? They've got a life plan together. They're going to get married. They're in this stage called betrothal. It was a year-long process before getting married. It was actually a binding period of a year before they got married officially. They've got plans. They love each other. And one day, Mary comes to Joseph and says, I'm pregnant. Now, we know how the story ends. But what must have Joseph felt in this moment? I'm pregnant. It's God's baby. What? And we know he's devastated because look at his response. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He's thinking, divorce, this is over. I've been betrayed. How could this be? We had a life that was going to be planned together. You see, the coming of Jesus for Joseph took a hammer to all of his plans. And Joseph was devastated. And as he's considering divorce, he has a messenger come to him. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph went from this devastated state. He goes to sleep. An angel appears to him and tells him, no, you've got it all wrong. God is doing something amazing here. He's sending his own son to save people from their sins. It's going to be God with us. Take Mary as your wife. You know what this meant for Joseph? In the eyes of everybody watching them, he was going to be marrying someone who was an adulteress. To follow the call of God on Christmas for Joseph meant that his reputation was going to be on the line. You see, Jesus coming to the world cost him. It cost him his plans. He had to lay down his future and he had to lay down his reputation was costly. It was the sacrifice of Christmas for Joseph, but he's not the only one who sacrificed. In in, uh, it goes on, it says, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. This takes immense faith. He's marrying someone who people would snicker about. You see, Joseph isn't the only one who Christmas cost him It was Mary as well. And Mary's story is outlined in great detail in Luke. Starting in chapter 1, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth was one of Mary's relatives, um, and she's pregnant, she's elderly. They thought she was barren. This was something that that she would never have a child. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. So Mary's chilling with Elizabeth, and all of a sudden an angel pops up and and says, Hey, God's for you. And this is Mary's response. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. She's An angel pops up and she's like, Whoa, hang on. I've read about this before. What's going on here? Like, where, where is God taking me in this? But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're going to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Most scholars believe that Mary was probably around 14 years old. She's a young girl. She's got plans with her future husband. And then God's got different plans for her. And then what this meant for Mary is culturally, 
if she had a baby outside of wedlock or their betrothal, they had, they had committed to each other. It was a legally binding thing. If she had a baby outside of that, she's considered an adulteress. And not only was her reputation on the line, but she could be stoned to death. They, they, they would, uh, adultery could have been uh, punished by stoning. And they would take rocks and they would hurl them at the person until they died. And Mary, she hears not only is she going to have a baby, but this baby is going to be great, called Son of the Most High, that he's going to have a throne that will ne- and a kingdom that will never end. Think about this. Mary was from a no-name town, a poor peasant who had no power, no influence. How is my son going to have a kingdom that will have no end? And she's got questions. She asked the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel explains The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, the one that she's currently visiting, is going to have a child in her old age. She who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will fail. So the angel kind of explains what's going to be happening. And look at Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What kind of immense faith does it take to make a statement like this? Your reputation, you're going to be gossiped about. You're going to be shamed. They're going to be snickering about you behind your back. And Mary lays all of that down and said, God is doing something great here. Let it be. And you see, Christmas cost. Joseph, it cost Mary, but the greatest sacrifice of Christmas was the sacrifice of Jesus. And in order to make, to bring Christmas back to the center on Christ, I want us to focus in on what Jesus laid down to come here. In Luke 2, this is, the story of Jesus' birth. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, that is Jesus, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Think about this. Jesus, eternal God, always existing in a perfect existence in heaven, outside of our time, outside of our broken world, powerful. Where does he come to? He doesn't come to a a palace with royalty where he can have whatever he wants, whatever he desires. He doesn't, he wasn't born into a political empire or a, a, a wealthy family. Jesus is born to poor people in a no name town in a manger. Now, a manger is not the cute little fixture that we often see in the nativity scenes today. This is a picture of what a manger looks like. They were normally carved out of stone. And what they were is they were a trough for animals to eat from. So you'd put the food in there and the animal would eat and their slobber would be in there and the bits of food that fell out of their mouth. That's where Jesus laid his head. He sacrificed heaven, perfection. Think about this for a moment. We have everything we need in our modern day American home, right? We have AC and heat. We have plumbing. We have refrigeration. Imagine leaving all of that and going to first century like Jesus, where you don't have that. You don't have any of the amenities of your home. Now that's a sacrifice. Now multiply that times infinity as God left heaven perfection. And he was born in a manger. John 1 has a very different telling of how Jesus came to the world. He kind of has this cosmic picture, and I love how he describes it. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus. And the Word was God, and and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So he has this, like, kind of, 
scaled back cosmic view of Jesus that in the beginning, before there was anything, Jesus was there. He's eternal. He's always existed. Right? And that he, he is God. He was there at the creation in the world. In fact, he says, look, everything that was made was created through him. He spoke existence into being. And then a little bit further down, he talks again about the word. In verse 14, he says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. That that Jesus sacrificed a perfect place where he was King of kings and Lord of lords and humbled himself to be a baby. Now he didn't lose his kingship, but he added infancy to himself. He couldn't help himself. He had to have people feed him, change him, take care of him, make sure he was warm and cared for. What immense humility is that? God of the universe in helpless babe. Like that's astounding that Jesus was willing to come and humble himself to be here among the broken and the dirty and the grimy. He came to live among sinners and wretches. And I love how it says this in Matthew 1. It says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said. This is again the angel speaking to Joseph through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, Jesus sacrificed it all so that he could be with us. He left perfection, righteous, holy, forever existence. And he came down into the broken and dirty places in our world. And that should give us hope. Because if Jesus isn't afraid to get down in the dirt and grime of this world, the brokenness of this world, he's not afraid to get down with me in the dirt and grime of my life. In fact, Jesus came down into the dirt with us that he might lift us up out of it and cleanse us from all of it. This is immense sacrifice on his part. And he chose to do it because he loves you. Because he loves me. In World War II, um, there was a, uh, a soldier named David Webster. Actually, part of his story is told in the, a miniseries called The Band of Brothers. And this is a picture of him. Um, and he was, right before D-Day, he decided he was going to switch from his infantry role to a paratrooper role. And so he was going to parachute onto the beach. And leading up to that, he got many letters from his mother who was extremely worried She's going to die. She's hearing the death tolls. She's worried for her son. And he writes her a letter. And he says, Mom, don't worry about me. This is important. And the the last line of his letter said this, Those things which are precious are saved only by sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed heaven to come here because you're precious to him. You are valuable and he's willing to get down in the brokenness of our world that he might redeem us. That's the sacrifice of Christmas. The next thing I want us to focus in on is the gift of Christmas. In Matthew 1, coming back to the passage, it says, She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. To save his people from their sins. This is the gift of of Christmas. That Jesus didn't just come down here to to vacation. He didn't come down here to just hang out with us. He came down here on a mission. His mission is this, to save people from their sins. He sees us in bondage and and struggling and, and, and dirty and a wretch. And he says, I want to save you. And here's how he did it. You see, he didn't stay a baby. The manger anticipates the cross. You see, without, without the cross and the to- or without the manger, you don't have the cross in the tomb. And so he came as a baby and he grew up and he lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. Not only did he not sin, we focus on that a lot, and that's totally true. Jesus was sinless. 
Not only did he not sin, though, he lived in perfect relationship with the Father. Always walking in the Spirit, obedient to what God called him to do. He lived the life that we're supposed to live, that we have no power to do outside of Christ. And then on the cross, he died in our place. He dealt with the real problem of our hearts, the disease. Ephesians 2 outlines the real problems of our hearts. It says that we are under the wrath of God, that we seek after our fleshly desires, that we follow, follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Satan. And ultimately, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. That's problems that you and I, we can never muster up anything to fix those. But Jesus, on the cross, God's wrath towards our sin, God as a holy, righteous judge, pours out his wrath on Jesus in our place. And as his wrath is poured out, the skies are dark and the rocks rent, the earth shakes, and Jesus cries out, it is finished. The mission I came to accomplish has been done. It's over. There's going to be freedom. And then three days later, he rises from the dead, confirming that he is who he said he was all along. And he triumphs over Satan, sin, and the grave. This is what Jesus inaugurated on that day that he came as a baby born to nobodies in a no-name town. And it's the movement that you and I are a part of. This is why we celebrate Christmas. God came here to save us. It's worthy of celebration. It's an amazing truth. And I'm afraid far too often we turn to things other than Jesus for salvation. We look from creation what only the Creator can give. And I think there's a a few places, or a few categories rather, of what the Bible calls idols that we tend to turn to. And I want to lean into some of those. Firstly, one of the idols we turn into, or turn to instead of Jesus is the idol of position. This idol looks like um, uh, climbing the social ladder, getting the, the promotion. Um, it looks like power, success, influence. It's the reason why in high school we wanted to be popular so bad, right? And this idol tells us if you only matter if you're successful, if you have a high position in society, you matter. But the problem is when there's failure instead of success, it hacks your identity. See, the idol of position says when you fail, you are a failure. Jesus says when you fail, you're still a son of God, you're still a daughter of God, you're a child. No one's taken that from you. That was blood bought and spirit sealed. You're a child of God. That's been taken care of on the cross. And we can worship the idol of position. The next one that we can often turn to instead of Jesus, who's come to save us from our sins, is possessions. Right? That, are, that have this stuff that I need. I need more stuff. I remember a couple of years ago, I was collecting records and I had hundreds of records, but I wanted more. I wanted the most unique one, the most rare one, the most cool looking one, the most expensive one. Why? Because I believed that the more stuff I had, the more I mattered. I was defined by my stuff. This is why we want the bigger house or the bigger car or the new toys or the new clothes or the new technology. Listen, a PlayStation 2 can't save you. You know where my PlayStation 2 ended up? I don't know. The garbage. Right? Everything we own will eventually end up in a dump or a secondhand store. And the sad thing is when possessions become our God, you don't own them. They own you. Jesus himself said, speaking of money, another type of possession, he said, look, you can't serve both God and money. Your heart only has one throne. And idols so easily take up residence there. John Calvin, a great theologian, said that the heart is a factory for idols. It just pumps them out. And Jesus isn't just somebody that you can add to your God shelf. I have 
my money over here. I have my prestige over here. I have my power over here. I'll have a little Jesus right here. Jesus doesn't add to the God shelf. He clears it. And so we can worship our possessions. The third category, and I think this is probably the most prevalent, is people. We worship people. This looks like that classic line of, you complete me. There's something missing inside of me and and I need it from you. I don't feel at peace, so I need it from you. Please help me feel peace. I felt this last weekend. I was going on a, uh, a, a trip with my wife. And I often will have a moment where I have this anxiety of, I'm worried about work. And I noticed my tendency to turn to my wife and say, hey, I'm okay, right? Like, I don't need to worry about work. Everything's gonna be all right, right? And I realized as I was processing that with her, I said, I think there's a problem here. I haven't talked to Jesus about this at all. And I'm seeing a pattern that I turn to you instead of God. She had become an idol in my heart. And it's so easy for us to try to seek from others what only our creator can give. And I think probably the person that we create, uh, make a God most often is ourselves. There's this whole culture around our pride, making ourselves look good. Social media is full of it. And I'm not saying social media is bad. But it is that idea of prop myself up, make me look good, hide the bad stuff. A lot of what we project on social media is not truth. That we create ourselves to be God. But I think there's a more subtle way that we make ourselves God. It's when we see problems in our life that need to change And we try to change them ourselves instead of turning the one to the one who can truly transform us. Where we say, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. Uh, By sheer exertion of my will, I'm going to change. I'm I'm never going to do this again. I'm going to try harder. Maybe we make promises. Listen, we have no power to change ourselves. And if we turn here, to look for transformation, you are looking to yourself for what only God can give you. There's an art exhibit at the Guggenheim called Can't Help Myself. This is a picture of it. It's a robotic arm that was created with two primary functions. The first is to dance. It was created to dance. But the artist created it with an inherent flaw. The machine leaks oil. Hence the mess everywhere. It leaks oil all over the place. It's a slow drip, but over time the puddle builds. And so its its secondary function is it has sensors all around it. And when the sensors notice that the oil goes out too far, it squeegees it back in. Well, you can imagine the small leak over time becomes a big mess. And that's what we see. And now the machine no longer functions with its primary purpose. It's too busy cleaning up its own mess. You know what it needs? The artists come in and fix the problem. But it's it's it can't function with its primary purpose, and so it's it's cleaning up the mess over here. And by the time it does that, oh, there's mess over here, and there's mess over here. And this is what we do when we turn to idols instead of Jesus. We're managing the mess, and we were never created to. You see, idols can't do anything about the disease, they can manage symptoms. You can feel temporary peace or temporary love, but they can't fix the real problem that Jesus came. He says, I came to save them from their sins. That's what Christmas is all about. I'm afraid we often turn to ourselves and try to clean ourselves up. And we are no match for the bondage, for the sin, for the lies we believe. Only Jesus can save you from those. Is this what your life looks like? Managing a mess that needs to be given over to God. See, Jesus came that Christmas morning that we don't have to turn to these idols. He came to show us he's pursuing us. That's the gift of Christmas. He's pursuing us. We don't have to turn elsewhere. He's coming after you. Have you turned to him? What is 
your response as we've looked at the sacrifice of Jesus leaving heaven, as we've looked at the gift of Christmas that Jesus is pursuing you, what is your response? You see, in the Christmas story, we see three pretty prominent responses to the coming of Christ. And I want to go over those as we close today. The first one is Herod. So Herod's the king. He's the ruler over this area. And uh, the, the Magi come, they visit Herod, and then they go and they worship Jesus. And when they had gone, it said, when they left Jesus, it says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. You see, Herod saw the coming of Christ and he said, this is a problem. It's a threat to my kingdom. I'm not about to bow down to somebody else. This is, I, he, I've got a good thing going here. I'm not going to let him manipul- or change this situation. So I'm going to try and manipulate everything so that I can make sure he doesn't impact my kingdom. And actually, in a deluded, lunatic rage, because he couldn't find out where Jesus was and he realized the Magi weren't going to tell him, he has all the boys of a certain age murdered. Now, you may not have the lunatic, murderous rage of King Herod. But do you resonate with the idea that, you know, if I follow Jesus, it's going to be a threat to my kingdom. I kind of like the way I live life. I like being in control. I like, I like living my, according to my own kingdom. Let me implore you. Your kingdom will crumble. It will never last. And we read earlier about the angel Gabriel's promise to Mary that Jesus' kingdom will go on forever. It is the only kingdom that is lasting. Whose kingdom are you building? Do you resonate with Herod? He's a threat. I kind of like the life I have. I don't want to surrender. I want to encourage you, come to Christ. You will be more fulfilled than anything you could ever build in your kingdom. So you could respond to Christmas like Herod did. There's another response that I see in in the Christmas story is the chief priests and the scribes. This is in Matthew 2. It says, when he had called together all the people's uh, chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born, in Bethlehem, in Judea. They replied, for this is what happened, or what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. You know what's really sad? This is the last time we hear about the chief priests and the scribes in this story. They had the information. They did nothing with it. They knew where the Savior was going to be born. There was this excitement as the wise men came and said, look, we're looking for this guy. He could be the Savior of the world. They had the information. They did nothing with it. We don't hear of them ever going Do you resonate with that? Maybe you've heard the Christmas story hundreds of times. Maybe you've heard the gospel thousands of times. Have you done anything with it? You see, no decision is a decision. And maybe you've been sitting in church for months or even years, but you've never truly come to that moment of repentance and faith. And here's what I want the Herods and the scribes to hear. Jesus died for you too. You see, even if you're struggling with, I don't want to give up my kingdom or, or you're, you're in indecision and I don't know how I feel about this and you've been sitting in church for a long time, you don't, never made a response. The death of Jesus was for you too. Now Herod, he never, he never repented and he ended up dying in his sin. What will your response be? The last response we see in the story that I want to point out is the wise men in Matthew 2. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen 
when it, uh, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They're getting excited. It stops over the place where Jesus is, and they're getting jacked. We're going to meet this family. We're going to see the Savior of the world. It goes on. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are king makers. Wise men were people of power and influence. And they come to a no-name town, to a poor family, to worship a baby. Why? Because they had the same information of Herod and of the scribes, but they believed it and they knew who Jesus was and that this was something God was doing in the world. Look at what they do. It says they bow down. This is a physical act of you are greater. And then they offer him expensive gifts. There was, they wanted to shower this newborn Savior with worship. And maybe you, re, you, you resonate with that. That this Christmas, you're just reflecting on the goodness of Jesus and his mission that began that Christmas day that he fulfilled on the cross in the empty tomb. That's so awesome. And so many of you shared with us some of the ways that you're celebrating Christmas and keeping Christ at the center. Many of you said you're doing Advent calendars or Advent and Christmas devotionals, or some of you are lighting Advent uh, candles every Sunday. Some of you shared that you're doing, uh, having your family act out the Christmas story every, every night for Bible story time. It's so encouraging to hear that our church is bringing Christ back to the center of Christmas. And here's just a little uh, encouragement. You see, the things that may work this year may not next year. The things that point you back to Christ can easily become a tradition, and traditions can easily become idols. So be okay innovating. Try something new to make Jesus the center of your Christmas. We come back to this question again. What's your response? Does, does Jesus just feel like a threat to your kingdom? Are you going to stay in indecision? Or are you, like the Magi, going to bow your heart down and worship him this year? Love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to release to the campuses.